Okay, I will uh, kick it off uh, quickly before we move to a main part. So welcome everybody while people are still joining. Welcome to our March session uh, in Stuttgart Power Platform user group. And as always, you can uh, find us on our YouTube channel on uh, Meetup and feel free to join us and uh, find all the interesting materials later on on our YouTube channel. Also, today I'm with you. Uh, next week, Christian will be here uh, with you on the uh, next session. So, as always, our goal is to connect you to best speakers out there pos we can possibly find. And tr we're trying to do it weekly. I think we're the only user group uh, doing it. And sometimes can feel like exhausting and a lot of work. But on the other hand, we are glad that we can bring the content to you. Uh, a little bit different format, so if you didn't join yesterday, so we had our first two sessions, first one with Chris Webb and yesterday with Phil Seamark, uh, myself and uh, Nikola Ilic, uh, we have a, every second Tuesday of month. So a uh, format different, we are not doing the technical talks, we are simply trying to get to know the people behind all those blogs and everything, and in April you can join us with uh, Will Thompson. Promise it will be another interesting session uh, like it was yesterday with Phil Seamark. And just on a user group, so next week uh, Fogme is, is with us uh, with in-page navigation techniques. And Megan on 23rd of March uh, with uh, inclusive report design and why should we care about it. So with that said, that's you see we have a full schedule and it's extreme pleasure on my side to join uh, to have Melissa join us again here for Stuttgart Power Platform user group. Melissa, welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us and uh, feel free to present yourself and take over the screen. Sounds good. Give me a second here just to get all that taken care of. I chose this picture that you see on the screen because it's not a straightforward easy path but with some planning, you won't fall over the rails. All right, so uh, as Augustine said, my name is Melissa Coates. I'm self-employed. I am a little bit different from most people in the Power BI world. And although I do have a development background in BI and data warehousing and all that kind of stuff, my current focus these days is on governance and administration type of topics. And I currently spend most of my time these days doing two things. Uh, one is training, and the other is doing some technical writing for Microsoft. And we're going to touch on a couple of the things that have been published most recently during this session. By the way, if I pop back a second to the main page, if you would like a copy of the slides that I am about to go over, um, you can get them from my website uh, on the presentations page. Our agenda today is really a very quick glimpse at a few of the things that I think are important if we're taking on governance of Power BI. What we're not going to do today is talk about exact specific tenant settings or exact specific detailed choices. This is a little bit more high level than that. And although we are going to have a few very tactical recommendations and such. Um, this is very much a session about the kinds of things that you want to be thinking about. In terms of questions, we'll be able to stop and pause for questions at every single one of these transition points. So go ahead if you've got something on your mind and pop it in the chat and we'll pick it up as we go through and then we should have some time at the end as well to handle any open questions. I am assuming that you're using Power BI currently and you've got some successes with it. So we're not going to talk about really any Power BI basics. Having said that, if you need me to pause and clarify what I mean by something, pop that in the chat. Augustine can stop me if we need to, and we will address that. So don't be shy. Absolutely uh, let us know if we need to double back and explore something. I'm also making the assumption that even though you've experienced some successes, you know that there's probably some areas of improvement. So having said that, 
Where I want to start is the Power BI Adoption Roadmap, and I'm going to put the link to it in the chat so that you have it handy. And you might already be saying adoption. I thought this was a governance session. And let me explain why the two are so interlinked. <laughs> so first, let me explain what the Power BI Adoption Roadmap is if you're not familiar with it. It's something that um, we released the first version of it several months ago, and you can think of it as this series of strategic and tactical things to think about, things that lead to a successful Power BI adoption. And there's 10 main areas, and the sequencing of all those areas is not a perfect thing, but we tried our best. Now, this roadmap is focused on what we're calling organizational adoption. So let me elaborate on that. In the roadmap, we talk about three kinds of adoption. And I want to introduce this because when you're starting it to think about governance, all of this stuff is so important. So if we first define organizational adoption, this is all about our governance and our data management practices, the things that are going to support and enable our BI efforts. That might be a little bit different of a definition than you expected. Now, user adoption, which is usually more of a familiar term to people, the way that we are using that term is it's specifically the user knowledge. And that translates as people gain greater knowledge over time, that translates into using Power BI the way we want it to be used, using it effectively. And then solution adoption, really focusing on the impact and the business value of that set of reports or that app you released or that set of requirements. So you can kind of think of it, solution adoption is a little bit more small picture and then user adoption is about our users and how effective they are using the tool and organizational adoption is really where our governance efforts fit in. And as you can already intuitively see, I'm sure, the better our organizational adoption practices are, solution and user adoption journeys are easier because it's all absolutely interrelated. So you in your organization, you might not decide to call them these three separate things, but they do need separate focus and attention. And the other thing while we're talking about adoption that I want to make sure to stress is that if you have previously thought about adoption as usage of the system, it is so much more than that. So if we're talking about Power BI adoption or really any technology adoption at all, we're not saying we just want people to use the technology more. Um, anybody that thinks it's just that is being very short-sighted. It's being effective with it, which is way harder to define and measure than we have more users, we have more reports, we have more report renders. And think of it this way. If we have people uploading tons and tons and tons of duplicate data sets, yeah, that's more usage, but that's not healthy adoption. If we have the vast majority of people doing nothing but exporting to Excel and using Power BI that way, that's not healthy adoption, even though it might be good usage stats. So each of my sections here is going to conclude with a couple of action items. So the first one for you is, if you're not familiar with it, just review the adoption roadmap end to end. Get familiar with the concepts, the considerations. Figure out what your current state is for each area. And we're going to talk more about that here in a couple of moments. There is also, and I'm kind of just sneaking this in at this point because it's a, a good spot to do it. There's also a new thing that we have just started releasing the first pieces of it. I'm going to put this link in the chat as well so you have it. We're calling it Power BI Implementation Planning. And the whole idea behind it is this. If you think about that adoption roadmap, it's kind of high level and it's kind of aspirational. 
And then we've got a ton of product documentation. And what we knew what we really needed is this thing in the middle that basically bridges the gap between all that detail level product documentation and this aspirational guidance about you need a healthy data culture. <laughs> and so Power BI implementation planning is where that's headed. So far, we've only released the first pieces. So this one's going to be different. This one, you in the community, you guys are going to see us publish something new over the course of the next few months uh, very, very consistently. Where we started is a first of the few usage scenarios. And if you remember, if you uh, were familiar with the Power BI Enterprise Deployment White Paper, that's that big 250 page Word document. I co authored it with Chris Webb. It hasn't been updated in almost two years now. It had usage scenarios in it. They've gotten basically uh, a facelift and gotten expanded. And that's where we decided to start. And we're gonna keep adding more and more pieces to this implementation planning here. But the reason why these usage scenarios are helpful is this idea of, well, two really. One is that Power BI can be used in different ways, even inside of a single department. And so having this awareness of how you're using Power BI or how you want to use it really just helps you make informed decisions. And conveying the information graphically instead of just text helps us hit different audiences in a different way. So um, check that out and just uh, revisit it from time to time as we keep building it out over the next few months. All right, let me take a step further into this idea of maturity levels. And just a reminder, if you have a question, pop it in the chat so that we can address it as we go along. In the adoption roadmap, we used these five maturity levels, and they're really very focused on that organizational adoption definition that we gave uh, a couple of minutes ago. The whole idea here behind the maturity levels is getting you thinking about where are you at now and where do you want to be. And we used the same five levels that are in the Power Cat adoption maturity model, so the rest of the Power Platform, and also Microsoft 365's maturity model. So if we start at the bottom on our way up, level 100, this is really just your starting point. Things are brand new or they're informally handled. And here's the thing. Good things can be happening at level 100. They're just overly reliant on the judgment and the experience of certain individuals. And if those certain individuals leave or change roles, what happens then? So this could be having good things happening, but it's probably inconsistent and it's probably undocumented. Level 200 is where we start to focus on repeatability. We've made this purposeful effort to start to standardize, improve, document our data management and our governance practices. And where we can, we learn from what's going on in the business units and we start to try to scale it out. But at this level, it's not necessarily happening uniformly across the entire organization yet. So at level 300, here's where we've got an approved governance plan. We have focus, we have objectives. We know what our priorities are and we can be more consistent across the organization. By the way, that doesn't mean everybody has to do things the exact same way, but it does mean that we know what's going on and we have consistency where possible and roles and responsibilities, people understand what's expected of them. So we've documented them and so forth. At level 400, we're doing really well with taking those learnings we have and picking up existing practices and we are scaling them throughout the org so that we can manage data better across the organization. And that also means that we know where does Power BI fit in our overall BI strategy. So we're not doing things haphazardly or based on what 
Joe down in his department thinks should be happening, which might be good and it might not be good. And finally, at the top level, we've gotten really good at making sure that all of our Power BI governance priorities, they're lining up with business objectives. We've got goals. We've got key performance indicators. We are tracking all of that and probably so that we can focus on continuous improvement, we've got automation happening as well. So level 500 is, is pretty darn mature. All right, so those are the five levels. By the way, every article in the adoption roadmap has some examples for the individual topic of what the levels might be. They're gonna be very generic. You're gonna need to customize them for what makes sense for your organization and your situation. So let's take this a step further because this gets really tricky. The thing is, is that we're gonna have these different maturity levels depending on whatever lens that we want to take. So let's say, for example, we go through the roadmap and we do an assessment and we think about where we are and we decide that the organization as a whole is at a level 300. But you're gonna find that certain business units or departments, they can be at different levels from the organization as a whole. And I think that's gonna intuitively make sense to a lot of you that maybe the accounting and finance people are doing things that are deeper and um, uh, more interested in taking data to another level than say, oh, what department should I pick on? I'll pick on the salespeople, right? So it depends on your data culture and it depends on the goals of that business unit and how they're staffing people. But you can see how that would, that would be different. And then we also have these different levels for the different capabilities. And by that, I mean those different 10 areas in the adoption roadmap. So for instance, maybe you're an international organization and you are highly regulated. So your governance capability, for instance, you might need to shoot for a level 400 or 500, but maybe that same organization, maybe you've got a lot of really highly trained data analysts. And although you have self-service BI going on, they're all very, very adept. So something like user support, even though it's important, you might say for us, a level of 300 is fine. Whereas some another organization might really need to invest a lot more on the user support side. All of which is to say, these differences in maturity levels, business units, capabilities, et cetera, they can be different or they can vary. And that can be purposeful based on where you've chosen to devote your resources or accidental if it's just something you've never paid attention to before. So my suggested action items are to take a look at each one of those areas. And again, they're very generic as written and figure out what success looks like for you. So customize those maturity levels and realistically decide, well, what should your goal be? And by the way, the goal this year might be one thing, and you might say by next year, perhaps we can get a little bit farther. And knowing that you don't have to shoot for level 500 in all areas, because we don't have enough time, money, people to, to shoot for 500 for absolutely everything across the board. Which brings us to priorities. One way we could think about prioritizing projects, people, time, money. Let's say you had $100 to spend. How would you allocate it? So let's say, for instance, your initial inclination is that data protection is absolutely number one. Does that mean you'd spend $50 of your $100 or 50% of your effort on data protection? Because the thing is, is as we start going through this sort of exercise, all these things are important. Are they equally important? So it's a little bit of an exercise just to help you focus and prioritize. 
prioritization also depends on where you find yourself right now. So a lot of organizations find yourselves in situation number one here where Power BI was rolled out and maybe licenses have been very freely granted. And now it's a year or two years later and things have gotten a little bit out of control. Absolutely great successes have happened, but there's also some things that have introduced risk and you find yourself needing to introduce some governance planning after the fact. And that's what number one here is basically trying to convey is that the governance planning comes later. And this is the hardest position to be in because at some point you're going to be asking people to change the way that they're working. And then number two here is the flip side, uh, organizations that do a large amount of governance planning up front before you open the doors, so to speak, to roll out Power BI. And these are the companies that are saying, we need six, eight, 10 months of planning before we can actually start using Power BI. And that's um, certainly relevant for some organizations to be able to start slower. But what the ideal is really is down here at number three, within reason, is where we figure it out as we go along and you know we iterate and to be fair this first one should this first one maybe be a little bit bigger than the rest certainly possibly and i say within reason because we can't constantly be changing our minds on what we want to do from a governance perspective and constantly be asking people to do something a little bit different but if we say that learning and improvement is a priority for us then everybody involved whether you're on the side of implementing and governing Power BI, or if you're an author creating solutions and sort of subject to the rules that are given to you, everybody kind of needs to be a little bit flexible to say, all right, we learned something, so we need to adjust. And that's what this number three is all about. So to put that another way, number three is really saying, at the same time, we want to keep building out that governance groundwork and still able to handle our analytical needs at least the most pressing ones if we're if we're trying to purposefully grow slowly and iteratively just improve and learn as we go along so my suggested action item here is knowing that you can't do it all figure out what's most important and is that based on certain pain points right now that are huge or is it certain um, opportunities that you know that you have to take advantage of and so prioritize those and i like to try to use this these four buckets of here's the things we know we need to do immediately what comes right behind it short term as soon as we can fit it in basically and then you know medium and longer term this is all about a backlog things that we know we want to get to is it going to be this month or this quarter no but then we're basically able to track what are our priorities and then we can track progress and it sounds like a lot of work yeah it probably is but here's the thing is if you have this information and i don't care if it's just in word or excel it doesn't have to be a really fancy project management system not only can you support what you've done over the last year or two years or whatever which you know we all forget and we undervalue the progress that we've made but if you need help getting funding or getting a new hire right? You've got all this data to help support those sorts of things. All right. Um, just a reminder, comments or questions, go ahead and just toss them in the chat. So one of our big um, things that we believe at the core with governing a self-service platform like Power BI is that we need to focus on user empowerment. And I know the word governance does not always evoke the words empowerment. And so I wanna talk a moment here about how governance can really improve the user experience if we take it on the right way. 
And the reason for that is we can save users so many headaches. And a lot of that has to do with helping support the people that are authoring content. But the people that are viewing and just consumers of content as well. So for that reason, the idea that I want to try to get you to do is think about governance from this aspect of user enablement. So that means we have three main goals for governing self-service BI. That first one is user enablement, helping our users be productive and efficient, but within the guardrails. So those guardrails are things like adhering to whatever internal requirements there are for the proper use of data and or complying with regulations. And usually these are externally imposed um, industry, governmental, contractual type of regulations. And so these three things are really broad, but they're, they're three broad umbrellas for what we are trying to do here. So the idea here behind improving the user experience with this idea of user enablement is providing clear and transparent guidance on what actions are permitted, why and how. And Matthew Roche likes to call this the yes and mentality. Basically meaning if somebody needs to do something, you know, for example, somebody in a small business unit needs to publish in a, a report to the entire organization. Well, what does it take to be able to say yes to that request? Oh, that's a tough question in the chat. How to train different roles to understand their duty in the adoption process. Um, we're going to talk briefly about roles and responsibilities here in a couple of minutes. Um, so let's let's touch on that then, um, because I've got that and a, a couple of other things that might um, give you some ideas there. But first, I want to step back for just a second, because we haven't yet defined data governance. And there's a bunch of definitions out there. This one from the Data Governance Institute, I like it because it's this system of decision rights and accountabilities that describe who can take what actions, you know, with what information, when, under what circumstances, using what methods. So here's the thing with data governance though. It's a misnomer. Although we call it data governance, that's really a misnomer. The primary focus for governance is not on the data itself, but governing what do people do with the data. So put another way, the true focus is on governing people's behavior to ensure organizational data is well managed. Back to that organizational adoption kind of uh, mentality there. And by the way, if governance is a dirty word in your company, just find something else to call it. Some people call it data utility. I don't know that I love that one, but I've heard it. Uh, I've heard data advocacy program. So you can find something in your organization if data governance is something that will politically just cause you issues. It's also something when we're saying the word governance, it means different things to different people. And where data governance actually starts or ends uh, will be different for every single one of you that are listening. And there are a lot of different people involved either directly or indirectly. So the larger the organization, the more opportunity that these different areas are quite literally separate. But of course, they all have tentacles into each other. And then depending on the context, if we're using the term governance, right, one person might think of, oh, it's that that certain accountability or responsibility that we have. And somebody else might think, oh, no, 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 it's that it's that group of people. And somebody else might think of it, it's that, that policy that we have to follow. And somebody else might think about it from the auditing perspective. So it's one of those terms that when you start saying, we need to invest here, um, it's 
it's worth being specific in what you mean because it means different things to different people. And this is also a good time to say not to use the terms governance and administration interchangeably. I see people do this a fair bit. Think of governance as we're going to create guidance, policies, uh, processes, et cetera, to make sure data is used the way we want it to be. But administration is more like those day-to-day -day activities that are going to enact the governance policies. So certainly related, but not interchangeably the exact same thing. So make sure that you know what your view of the world is, right? What your governance goals are and what's important. And certainly some of that's strategic and some of it is more tactical. And we're going to talk in just a couple of minutes about four factors that are going to help you decide well, what's the right level of governance. So hang on for that um, here in just a second. So Augustine says, how much of change management is needed to introduce governance and how to drive it? I think this is one we should probably circle back at the end and, and elaborate on a little bit more. My opinion here is as the importance of the content grows, and um, we'll talk about these four factors in just a couple minutes, but as it gets more important or more critical, inherently your governance will have to be a little bit more um, of a factor. So that inherently also means change change management change enablement so for instance you've got some content that a thousand people in the organization are viewing we've got to protect it and so how do we protect that does it mean three different workspaces with dev test prod maybe does it mean restricting who can publish to the production content maybe right it could be a, a number of different things and if you want at the end we can we can kind of bat around some of those ideas but i think that change management governance are both kind of in the same category as they need to be right sized and not necessarily the exact same thing asked of everybody across the board for all of the content so as you're thinking about, well, what actions do we need to take, right? Where do we want our maturity level to be? What are our priorities? The thing is, is your data culture matters and it matters a lot. And if you're not familiar with Matthew Roche's blog series and video series on data culture, um, his website is at ssbipolar.com. And he's got lots of good stuff there. And the way he defines data culture is that it promotes and encourages data-driven decisions by more stakeholders in more parts of the organization. And that's really what self-service BI is usually all about. We could talk about these aspects of a data culture to keep it as simple and quick as possible. The three of them that I tend to um, think about mostly is data discovery. Basically, we know where to find the data. And I think we've all experienced some version of, oh, we got to go ask Joe because Joe knows where to find it. Um, and how do we make it more approachable for more authors or more people to find the data that they need? Data literacy is that we understand what we're seeing. And that can be from the consumer perspective, it can also be the authors that are putting together um, reports that are not misleading. And then data democratization is that, well, we can use the data. And let me elaborate on that just a little bit more. Because these three aspects are very, very much about promoting usage of the data, which is a good thing because the more we use the data, the more data driven we become. But here's the thing, there's this natural struggle. And here's where I need to borrow something from Laura Madsen. She's got this great book called Disrupting Data Governance. 
She talks about how there's this natural struggle between protecting the data and promoting the data. And I think in self-service BI, this is a huge, huge point because what we want is for the ability to use the data. That's data democratization. And we want that usage of the data to be just as much of a priority as protecting the data. So um, I'm curious if anybody wants to, to put a message in the chat about if that's something that you, you struggle with uh, personally where you work or not. So to wrap up, things to think about a data culture. The kinds of things that we want to increase when we are trying to strengthen our data culture is that we are using data, you know, actively, consistently, et cetera, for informed decision making and by more stakeholders and by methods and best practices endorsed by the center of excellence. And by the way, I personally don't have a strong opinion if you need a center of excellence on your organization chart. What you do need is somebody that is doing the things that the center of excellence would focus on. And we're going to talk more about that here in just a few minutes. We want to expand our usage of trusted data and this idea that we can continually adapt and learn, which requires flexibility, that little chart that we went uh, through just a few minutes ago. So those are all things that mean our data culture is healthy. And the things that we want to reduce are reliance on undocumented knowledge. So that example of Joe's the only person who knows how to access that data. Um, we don't want analytics to be allowed only for the chosen few. And that's a bit of a warning sign from a data culture perspective. Now, certainly not every industry or every organization is going to approach self-service BI the same way, right? Uh, I was talking to somebody just the other day whose vast majority of self-service users are nurses. And, you know, they've got far other things to do than to do um, a lot of deep, deep training on the technical side of Power BI. And so how you approach supporting them versus a whole bunch of finance people, for instance, is a very different thing. But we want to reduce our reliance on hunches and gut decisions, right? We've all seen the highest person's opinion in the room, the hippo, right? That happens. Of course, it's still going to happen. We're all humans, but data-informed decisions is, is what we're shooting for. And this idea of hero mentalities, and this one, what I mean by this is you know somebody who is fantastic. They know how to get things done. They know um, how to access that data, how to create a great data model, et cetera everybody goes to them. So guess what? They are so backed up because they have become a very important uh, cog in the wheel. And that means they end up becoming a bottleneck if they are the only person who's able to do a certain thing. And then because they've gotten so busy, even though they know better, they might be creating substandard work that isn't scalable or isn't maintainable because they're so darn overworked. And so we just kind of want to reduce how much we rely on those sorts of behaviors and can we get more people involved and, and more people trained? And I know, easier said than done. And then the last one really is this idea of reducing rigid governance approaches. You've heard me say, you know, we value user empowerment and that's that's what we're going for here. Um, Ken, I'm going to come back to your question here um, in just a minute because we're going to go through some criteria and I think that it will be um, good to hang out here in a second. Um, Gary says, protecting the data versus promoting the data. Never thought of it this way before, but agree it's huge, especially in highly regulated industries. Um, yeah, I think it's it's such a great concept that I had to borrow it from Laura's book. Um, and by the way, if you grab a copy of my slides, a link to, to her book is, is towards the end as well. 
So the action here is really just to figure out what's really going on. And you might need to go and talk to some people and figure out when you say you're doing self-service BI, well, what does that really mean? And of course, tie that into what do we need to change and grow and mature? All right, so this is, this is a really good one. We talked earlier about goals and priorities, and we know we need to understand what's happening today and basically understand our uh, current state essentially. And uh, in here, let me just pop to it real quick because I think there's a couple of people in the chat asking about the book. Uh, so the book I was just referencing uh, is this one right here. Whoops. One by Laura. So I've got a couple of things in uh, the the end. Oh, that came out nice and big. Sorry. Uh, all right. Whoopsie. Didn't work out well. Let's take two on that one. Okay. Are four factors for deciding the appropriate level of governance. So we want to think about who owns and manages the content, the scope of content delivery, the subject area, and the importance or the criticality level. So let me let's actually talk about these four. And this I think is a good place for you to start to figure out if we need to make a decision and we need to create a policy on something, for instance. Um, what are the inputs to that? So the first one is all about who owns and manages the content. And um, a version of this has been floating around for years and years. If we, if we break this down and we start at the, the far right, Enterprise BI means that some sort of centralized team owns and manages both the data and the reports. If we go to the far left, the business-led self-service BI means that a decentralized team owns and manages all of the content. So as you can imagine, where it gets trickier is this managed self-service BI approach in the middle. So here's where we've got our data that is centralized and we've got the reports that are decentralized. Now, this is often talked about as, oh, IT or the center of excellence or the BI team owns and manages the data and the individual business units create reports from it. And that works. But the concept of managed self-service BI can also be used within a decentralized team as well. So for instance, one or two data analysts need to support a whole bunch of different report writers. So um, managed self-service BI um, is something that I think can be used at various different levels within the org. But the concept of who owns and manages the content is super, super important for governance decisions because generally speaking, there's more oversight when we move towards the right of the diagram. But here's the thing, who owns and manages it is not the whole part of the story because who owns it needs to be matched up with who are we delivering it to? So the idea of the scope of who is using the content is an important part of the equation, because generally speaking, personal content, think of I've got a report in my own personal workspace. We're not going to implement a bunch of governance rules on that, uh, is very, very different than content that's being distributed very widely throughout the organization. So if we take those notions, number one and number two, and try to basically put them side by side, if we've got business-led content that they're delivering to just their team, no problem. If we've got the enterprise BI team that is producing content really for you know any level, those combinations are logical and are expected. 
Where this gets tricky is when something like this wants to happen, you know, or even, you know, even this, right? When you start to get the combinations that don't uh, line up quite as easily, and usually that is somebody within an individual team wanting to distribute content very broadly in the organization. So kind of aligning the, the number one and the number two items. Number three is all about recognizing all of our data is not equal. And certain types of data fundamentally need more strict oversight as to what we're going to do with that data. So maybe our sensitive financial data, maybe we've got personal data, uh, our customer data, for instance, that is subject to some regulatory oversight. Or, you know, maybe we just know that it's uh, our closely guarded proprietary internal data to the organization that we need to be particularly careful about. So that's item number three. And then item number four is basically just trying to say, well, what's the importance level or the criticality level? And there's a number of different ways you could start to think about this. So one is, well, we need this to make timely decisions. So if we don't have the sales numbers by 10 a.m. every single morning, that is a big problem. So that's the kind of thing that I mean here, um, very closely related to, it's just, it's just vital information for how we operate our business. And so this might mean that self-service BI is really doing a lot of operational reporting and that happens and that's okay. Maybe we've got customer facing data that we know the criticality level is uh, way through the roof. Or maybe it's just more of a technical thing that this data has an inordinately high number of downstream dependencies that we know it is really, really critical. So armed with these four pieces of information, we can then start to figure out, well, how do we decide what the policy is or the process or whatever? So what you want to do is start to think about what your criteria is for de defining a governance policy. And so, for instance, you might have a policy for um, the requirements to get a data set certified. And these types of things here are going to influence how you handle that and what the requirements are. The other thing in this area that you want to think about is, well, what groups should manage their own content? And depending on your organization, you might say that Ooh, that on the left, that business-led self-service BI just makes you nervous. But there are very capable people um, that can reside within those business units and be more than equipped to handle it if we give them the proper support and guidance, et cetera, et cetera. And then you want to think about, well, if we're doing that managed self-service BI, that one in the middle, what happens when we've got multiple teams involved or even if there's this co-ownership situation where you say that uh, the data is managed here, the reports are managed here. So by the time the information is surfaced on a report, it has basically not necessarily changed hands, but has not just one person or team to look at uh, is what we start thinking about there when we're thinking about co-ownership. All right, so let's see here. Let me circle back here a second. Ken says, I hear what you're saying with personal, but there's a fear among management that a user can be oversharing from a personal or shared workspace. I know we can monitor and talk to that user, but what other tools can be used from a sharing ungoverned data? It's really funny you say that because I have a million caveats to almost everything that I want to say. <laughs> That's one of them. So yes, um, towards the end of this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about the activity log. And one of the biggest things that you can do is look for somebody is using their personal workspace a lot. They're sharing out of their workspace a lot. 
uh, I'm sorry, personal, if I didn't say personal workspace a lot, and that just equals risk. So the personal workspace has its place, but if it's being overused, that is risk, and that is not acceptable, usually, once we basically assess, well, here's how we want things to happen. So if we've got guidance for our authors and we explain to them, we want the, we want you to use the standard workspaces and here's why, right? Tell them why. Most people will do what you ask for them to do if they understand that there's a good reason why and it's not just somebody on a power trip. So if you do have to restrict them creating their own workspace, have that process be as fast and painless as possible um, and just teach people, you know, what you what you need them to do and then catch it on the activity log. And then it, without being creepy about it, right, contact them to say, we see that you are uh, sharing this report with dozens of people, for instance, out of your workspace, your personal workspace. So here's what we, we need you to do instead. Right. So. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a great point. Thank you, Ken. Uh, OK, looks like I didn't hit send on my earlier link, so I just did. There's there's the one with the big text with. Uh, let's see here. So. How do you do? How do you not do command and control when management expects control? I'm struggling with allowing users to get to data, but control who sees what. And I think just because you decide, here's how things should be, and even if you create this beautiful governance document, that could ease some people's fears, but just having a document is not a magical thing that that makes it all okay. It it can even almost be relied on too much that, oh yeah, we have it documented, everything's fine. Um, so I think it's a balance. And so if you make the decision that maybe you need to be a little bit more controlling versus enabling for certain reasons, I would have that in your governance document and it's not necessarily something that you have to share with everybody, but basically the reasoning why certain decisions are being made. Um, if that comes down to our, um, our executive sponsor is so-and-so and they have mandated that we handle it this way, you know, that's something that I would, that I would document in our decisions document and what the date was and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have a, a perfect answer for how to do that. Um, we're getting close to the end here. So Augustine, if we want to open it up to do some uh, additional chats on, on those sorts of topics, we absolutely can. We can. So. Um, supporting the internal community of users, this is just a quick one because there's so much to talk about here. We, this is a big, this is a big initiative to have support in place, to prioritize sharing knowledge, to give people training. And so we, we talk about this all quite a bit over in the adoption roadmap. So I don't wanna take a lot of time to talk about it here other than to really say that if, in, if decreasing risk is a real need, and I mean we've all got we've all got risk of uh, you know data leakage or even just sharing the wrong data internally. Um, one of the best ways that we reduce risk is to increase knowledge. We train people, we give them support, we give them help. And yes, I know everybody's busy and. A lot of times just getting the thing done today <laughs> is the top priority. But um, but when done well, this is game changing stuff. So um, I don't want to talk a lot about a center of excellence. We do talk about it in the adoption roadmap, but the center of excellence is your group of people who are the experts inside the organization and 
they are there to support others. So what a center of excellence or equivalent could just be your BI team doing all this stuff and that's okay. But what they're gonna do is gonna vary from org to org, but it's always or should always, in my opinion, include the four items that I have here, which one is who's gonna nurture that internal Power BI community. So help get questions answered, et cetera. Who's going to mentor and build those champions in your departments? So those are the people that are enthusiastic about Power BI. And we wanna give them a little bit of extra support so that as they oftentimes are almost the first line of support out in their own department, we wanna help them do that well. And who's going to manage the governance model? Is it officially somebody in the governance team? Is it somebody that's more focused on self-service BI and then has you know, a bridge over to the formal governance organization? And then this last one is really, really huge. They have this cross-departmental view into what's happening across the organization. So way at the beginning, we talked about those different maturity levels and how they can be different among teams and among different capabilities. Somebody and and the COE or equivalent team that is in tune enough with what's going on with the users and is able to say, hey, the operations team down here is doing something really cool. We want to learn more and we want to share with the rest of the org how they're doing this so that we can basically scale out those good practices. So these four things are really important that the COE focus on. Um, they're they're hard, right? It's, it's hard to put this kind of stuff in a job description. The COE might also take on things like direct user support. They might also just be kind of uh, elevated, you know, level, level three support, that kind of thing. They might also be your system administrators. Um, uh, that could be an IT, that could be in the COE, depends. They might also do some hands-on development as well. Kind of just depends on how you have everything structured. And then you want to set up what we think of as some sort of Power BI hub. So probably something like a SharePoint site. Here's where you want to teach people. This is where we go to ask questions, uh, to share documentation, to find links, uh, to pick up the training resources and info because training can be really well done with a curated set of links. So something that whomever's putting that set together knows that the link that you're putting out there, this is good solid info, it's relatively current from a reputable source, et cetera, et cetera. And then having a good support model. And in the roadmap, we talk about um, why the informal and the formal support methods are so important uh, because different types of people will use uh, the, different, the different ways. So uh, we can talk about that more here in a couple minutes if, uh, if anybody wants to here towards the end. And think about office hours. It's one of the most popular things. Uh, one or two people from the Center of Excellence or the BI team is available to help answer questions, might even just work through a problem right then and there, that kind of thing. Ah, and Ken said, yes, he heard office hours should be should be offered. Should this only be for the power users and or should it be for the larger BI community? And kind of depends. So giving your authors and or champions some space special resources is not a bad thing. I would say if you are going to restrict it to just a certain number of people, I would also offer one that's open to anybody. Um, yes, reason for separating is power users more technical, whereas the larger community might have more simple questions. Absolutely. You can also be set up to just jump into um, separate little rooms. So um, for instance, we could say, hey, Augustine, will you take uh, Joe and anybody else who wants to listen off into the uh, such and such side room? 
um, whether it's virtually or physically, and you know, go talk about that while we carry on with with such and such. I can I can tell you to hear from my experience. So I am leading a COE for Power BI in my company, and uh, having it for everybody is great. Uh, also, try to nurture those champions in a separate one because they would usually need more specific deep dive support than a general audience, but trying to include them in a general audience calls gives them more responsibility, visibility, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, here's the thing that I was that I was talking about with user support um, that we talk about in the user support article. And and yeah, the the reason I'm pointing this out here is because We've got this idea of informal user support that your champions might be taking on directly. So if you, the COE, have this layer of support for your champions so that they can do this layer of support uh, for their team members before it gets to more of the formal levels, um, that can all work really nicely and, and work nicely together. All right, just got another couple things to to run through, and then we can we can open it up. Um, so, roles and responsibilities is something that is really important, so that people know what is expected of them. Here's the thing: they also can't be set in concrete, because your self service users are going to vary wildly in their skills and and what they want to take on. So one self-service author does not equate another self-service author. And, you know, if you've got somebody that I jokingly say is a little bit of a cowboy, you know, do we want to almost encourage that? And so how can you build in some amount of flexibility with who does what? So when we're thinking about accountability, we want to think about these three levels. So at the bottom, we've got our operational people. These are your authors, and these are the people, you know, out uh, in the business units doing the work. Level two, this tactical level across business units, um, these are the groups like your center of excellence, for instance, like IT. They're going to help support and span the business units. And at the top, we've got the strategic level. So the biggest takeaway here is that the people in that operational level they are the foundation of your well-governed system and then the authority and the empowerment across the organization to help make decisions and get things done starts to exist at levels two and three might exist some at level one two right uh depending on people's roles but the people in that foundation are really important and they don't want governance done to them so hopefully you can help learn what's already happening and formalize it whenever possible so here's just me saying it again because it's important enough so make sure you know who your executive sponsor is does this person have authority to get things done around the organization and define your roles and responsibilities so that people are clear on the expectations that you have of them and include those in an HR job description whenever it's practical or necessary. So when someone's acting in the role of a Power BI champion, a lot of times that's not formally recognized. Should it be? And that kind of depends on your data culture. And uh, if things are happening, the way you want them to be, and the person is already getting the recognition that they deserve, maybe it doesn't have to be there, but maybe it really uh, is helpful in some cases. All right, transparency about system admin. This is just all about how people read things online, about what they can do. It doesn't work, and they don't know why. So what you want to avoid is having a Power BI administrator just decide all on their own what should and shouldn't be allowed. And here I'm talking about tenant settings. So review each tenant setting. Make sure that it's a very purposeful decision. 
what behaviors do you want to encourage? What do you need to deny? So if you're somebody that says, oh, we have to turn off export to Excel, that's when I want to have a more serious conversation about why is that, right? Uh, as opposed to re-educating people to use it only in certain circumstances. And then you want to review these settings on a regular basis. Um, a, to make sure they're still the way you want them to be, and B, new things sneak in all the time, and it's a good excuse to, to do that. I also want to encourage you to document those settings for your internal community, including which group is assigned to each setting. So that means if somebody needs to do a thing, like my example I always use is push apps to end users. If they want to be able to do that thing, what group do they go and ask for permission from? And this is all needed because there's not a reader role for tenant settings in the Power BI service. One day we can hope. Ken asks, is there any way to export tenant settings or allow someone who is not an admin to see them? No and no. Hence, creating this piece of documentation and just publishing it in your, in your internal hub. I know, it's not great. Also take a look at who's your administrator. By the way, Power Platform administrators are also Power BI administrators. Not true, a Power BI administrator is not also a Power Platform admin, but anybody who's got the global admin role, the Power Platform admin role, or the Power BI admin role is a, is a Power BI service admin, which is a very high privilege role. So reduce the number of administrators you have if it's more than just a few. All right, adoption and monitoring. Um, I'm not gonna elaborate on this a lot. We talked briefly uh, a few minutes ago about using the activity log to find things, you know, like oversharing. We also want to know well, what content's most critical or what changes are happening when, or do we need to provide some data to auditors? Um, monitoring our adoption efforts and figuring out data trustworthiness levels. So we can we can start to figure out if uh, if we have 3,000 reports, hopefully we don't also have 3,000 data sets, right? Um, we can figure out who is uh, or is not using their Power BI license. We can really start to understand usage patterns and maybe find training opportunities uh, and suspicious usage patterns, things we don't like to see. So if you aren't already, um, go get that activity log data. Just start storing it away if you if you are not already. Um, grab the raw data. Do not uh, do not massage it uh, or structure it into columns before you get it. Just pull out that JSON, store the raw data. Um, then you can spend some additional time putting structure to it, giving it a data model, and um, figuring out what's really happening and what action you want to take from it. And then over time, you can start to add in other pieces of data from the other APIs, et cetera. As you can imagine, this one point alone, you know, we could we could talk the entire hour and a half about it. OK, so all of that uh, was the the top essential tips, if you will, on, you know, really kind of getting started with what we want to think about from a governance perspective. Um, there's a lot to it for sure. So before we open it up for the rest of the time for q and I just want to point out um, there are some links here. If you want a copy of the slides that we went through today, you can find that on the presentations page. If you like this content, I've got gobs and gobs and gobs more of it uh, that goes into a lot more detail um, here and then a few other community resources from me as well. All right, so let's see here. Donald says, I've stored the log in ADLS, so Azure Data Lake Storage, in JSON format and built a simple data model to parse it, even did an incremental commit, as she says, very useful to monitor report usage. Yes, indeed. Glad to hear it. Just one question from my side, Melissa. So with your experience and everything, how much uh, do you think, uh, do we have many companies on, I don't know, level 500 of uh, adoption? <laughs> Maturity. Nobody. Seriously. I mean, um, 
most people that I talk to and work with are having a lot of struggles and surprisingly few guardrails in place. There's a couple that I've worked with in the past as well that are almost on the flip side and have turned a lot of things off and are highly limiting uh, what people are able to do and really trying to do enterprise BI mostly. Um, and I wouldn't say that that's a level 500 either, um, at least in, in most cases, right? If we're going to say that enabling users uh, more people to use data, you know, is a is a important value. So I have not seen an abundance of mature organizations. Um, how about how about you in your consulting field? So still still nothing. So most are struggling between level 100 and 200 and few are between 200 and 300 uh, i would say uh, at least from my experience and pretty much all the that's why this adoption document is a perfect uh, resource all the things are can be put uh, on the same uh, same things everybody is struggling pretty much with the same things everybody jumped on a power bi train few years back all in and now figuring out what to do after everybody's in. Yes, and where where I get slightly concerned is the company that says, hey, Power BI is just another productivity tool. I don't worry about what people are doing with Word and Excel. They can learn, they can figure it out. Power BI is in our E5 license. And so why should I think of it as anything besides a commodity tool? And, you know, after you pick me up off the floor, um, <laughs> you know, that I, I think that that's just going too far on the side of users will figure it out on their own. And some people will make great choices, but many, many, many people are just so darn busy that they're just gonna do what's easiest and that may or may not be in the best interest of, you know, the organization as a whole and advancing, you know, our analytical efforts. I see also a few people in a few questions in the chat and I see a few people on a call, for example, Rishi, who is doing a lot of work with governance. Rishi, you have any comments? Um, yeah, I've got loads of thoughts on this. Um, I'm doing I'm doing a session on Friday actually on Power BI governance and SQL bits. Um, so uh, yeah, your your content list has really helped in, in coming up with this. I mean, one of the things that I I'm focusing on is um, distinguishing between enterprise BI and team personal BI. So you you can you can't manage it all. Your enterprise BI is the content that connects to your enterprise data platforms. Your source, you know, it has data, it uses data flows and it uses shared data sets and FIN reports that publish the SAPs. Everything is managed through as your active directory groups. Um, you know, that's that's the bit that you need to control and manage in a particular way. And then you can have team workspaces that you you don't manage as closely. You don't need to manage as closely. You let people do do their own thing. And you have a you have a process to say, okay, if you want to bring this into the enterprise BI world and you know you will have better support, SNAs with it you will you know you'll it'll be trusted data it'll be certified it'll be endorsed um all of that good stuff that comes in enterprise bi you need a process to be able to say okay how could you move something from team personal bi into enterprise bi but you can't manage it all so you kind of pick your battles with this i think yeah and i, I like that um so in the roadmap and then also in all of my training materials i approach it just a smidge differently but it's really just a, a just a smidge so you know we talk about the the who owns it right and then we talk about the content delivery scope so yeah. here's your personal team departmental yeah. but um then we take the you know those four criteria that we talked about earlier with the you know what's the data in addition to these two items and how critical is it etc and then define the governance rules so just because it's team bi or just because it's departmental bi at least when i present it so doesn't mean it's right just saying um when i present it i say 
what does it mean we have to use Azure Active Directory groups for every single um, uh, uh, piece of security, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. If it's yeah. considered yes. governed or managed, then yeah. perhaps that that's, is yeah. one of the things that's on the list as a requirement. And then, yeah. of course, yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 So enterprise BI is where you use AAD groups. It's where it connects to enterprise data sources. It's where it's, um, you know, shared data sets, data flow architecture. So, yeah, I think I think you, you kind of focus on some of that and that helps to manage the scope. Um, and, you know, trying to, and I think you need a bit of automation with this as well, right? So uh, in terms of, you know, you can have people, people for tenant settings. One of the things I do with tenant settings is say, well, actually look at it in different categories. Either it's enabled for everyone, disabled for everyone, obviously enabled for people who are, who have undergone Power BI training, maybe a capability group or enabled for a use case basis. So something like publish to web. I wouldn't necessarily say you enable it based on people's roles, you base, if someone has a use case to publish to web, they can go and submit a power app form or whatever it is. And then once that gets approved, they get automatically mm -hmm. added to the AD group that allows them to then publish to web. So I think yeah. things like that, having processes and automation around it will help to really kind of drive that, drive that administration. Um, totally agreed. So yeah, especially for the tenant settings, which I'm pulling up right now, and by the way, I do see the other couple of questions in the chat, so I'll shift over there in a second. But um, the the point that I want to um, to say is, you know, we'll just use this one. But tenant settings is um, a big one where we often can't necessarily use existing AAD groups that align with the org chart. With of course, yeah, with yeah. here, right? So. Yeah. For yeah, instance, yeah, absolutely. you know, Power BI Workspace Creators is the group you'd have to ask for to be in it, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, what's the the one you just yeah, used you have a your second own ago? Groups of these. Published yeah, exactly, to web. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, you know, I like the group called Power BI Public Publishing just because when you're looking at it over on the group side, it's like, ooh, public. That sounds dangerous, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, yeah, making them Power BI specific. Which the trade-off, of course, is then you're managing AAD groups specifically for Power BI functionality. But yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is this is kind of what I'm struggling with at the moment is because you know I've, I've proposed an approach to my client at the moment to have you know a certain number of AAD groups for tenant settings, a certain number of AAD groups for you know reused across enterprise BI for app distribution for um, that, those same groups have build permissions on data sets, satellites, you have view permissions on the data flow data workspaces. So you, we have all these different AD groups that we need to manage. Um, and yeah, and I got pushed back on that straight away, <laughs> saying we're not going to create thousands of AD groups. Sorry, it's just not going to happen. Yes. So and um, <laughs> that's what I asked you about a few weeks ago. Um, yes. And Ken's question in the chat is, is exactly on that point you're saying. So yeah. he says, how do you manage workspaces versus apps in terms of access? Oh, yeah. We're using AD groups for apps, but workspaces are tricky since there can be a lot of them and they can have different roles, which mean an AD group for each role. So, yes, what that means is you've got an AD group. So let's say we've got um, the, the sales data workspace, for instance. You've got an AD group for uh, viewer, member, contributor, and uh, uh, admin plus the app viewer. So there's a fifth, right? Um, so if you start to then extrapolate that for all of the key workspaces that you're saying are governed in a way that to require AD groups, um, you have just blown up your number of groups. So that's where um, I'm not necessarily as strict as saying, you have to have to have to have AD groups for, you know, this governed category. I don't want a maintenance right. nightmare and I don't want to have to go touch 150 things if somebody transfers. So there's that. But I think it's a balance of saying what's the easiest thing. And the problem is that anybody who's an admin of the workspace can go and you know, add somebody. So then we've got the auditing side of things behind after the fact to say, oh, we said only AD groups, but I see that Melissa just got added as an individual. 
let's go fix that, right? It's like this ongoing battle. So I, I feel like it's a it's a mix, but I like presenting the information to say that if we've got governed data, this is the best way to do it, assuming that from a maintenance and an yeah. audibility standpoint, it also makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just put in the chat a diagram that I kind of use as well to to explain the kind of workspace structure and then access uh, around that. So you have to, you have workspaces for your data flows. You assign your analyst community, you know, by subject area potentially. You assign them um, viewer rights on those workspaces, and they can access the data flows. You assign the same groups bill permissions on the data set workspaces, the subject areas, and then you have um, analysts connecting to those. And then they're building thin reports and then publishing those as apps. Yep, yep, yep. And this so, is stuff that we talk about, you know, in a lot of detail in, in a lot of my other content, right? This this particular sure. presentation is kind of high level and, and doesn't go into all those nitty gritty details. But yes, we could spend the whole hour talking about that strategy. So I love it. Um, I do want to make sure we get to uh, Joel's, Joel's question. Yeah. Okay. Says, so should governance planning be led by IT? Or can it be led by someone in one of the business units, maybe with buy-in from IT? Our IT department is just so stretched doing other things, but we need to establish governance policies in our org. So um, I would say that if the person or persons that have the incentive like they want to do this, right? And they also have enough influence to get it done, right? So it can't just be necessarily an accountant, right? This person needs to probably have enough influence throughout the org. But absolutely, I would agree that partnering with IT um, and, and it not coming from IT directly can actually even be a good thing, uh, depending on how healthy that relationship has been in the past. Um, as long as you've got enough ability to get things done, because as you're talking about governance, you start to want to talk about consistency at some point, and that means you got to have influence in the org uh, beyond just you know one single team. Uh, what do you think, Augustine? Uh, completely, completely agree there. So at the end, uh, I wouldn't put it as led by IT, but I would closely collaborate with them and try to be friends with them because you uh -huh. need each other uh, at the end. Absolutely, absolutely. And especially your Power BI administrators, right? There's a bunch of people in IT that they're going to be back and forth with, not every day, but from time to time. And, you know, it all you know, it all uh, interacts for sure, and we're all on the same team. So. Yeah, well, I was just thinking, what's your thinking about where should, uh, when you mentioned Power BI administrator, where should they be? IT led, it's somewhere in the middle, COE, uh, because it's always a struggle where to put the administrator for Power BI. Yeah, so I think if you have a COE that's focused on analytics, right? It doesn't have to be just a Power BI COE. Um, in fact, a lot of cases it's a it's an analytics COE, especially if you've got three, four, five business intelligence tools. But that's a perfect place. Doesn't mean there's not also maybe one or two people in IT that technically have that role as well. I think that that's perfect. Um, if your BI team or even certain people from IT are are performing that COE role. Um, I feel like it belongs with that team, whatever you call them. Just because the best Power BI administrator are people that understand what the heck's happening in the system. It's not, it doesn't mean that if you're an IT person, you have no idea what the heck Power BI is, that you can't go in and change some settings. But if you don't really get it, you're just not as effective at being the administrator. That's that's completely true because people, especially with uh, with all the updates and changes happening in uh, Power BI monthly, usually oh, yeah. IDs. If the person sits in IT, they are a few months behind regularly because of all reasons, good reasons and bad reasons, but they are usually behind. Oh sure, sure. Because and especially if you're if they're 
administering, you know, 11 different systems. And yeah. It was it was uh, easy in the past when we had, I don't know, SQL Server with uh, SharePoint and update it once a year or once every two years. But now with the Power BI, it's a whole different world. It's a struggle, that's for sure. If anybody has any more questions, feel free to unmute yourself or, uh, yeah, Rishi is posting yeah, his image. Thanks, Rishi. Oh, thank you very much. And if anybody has any questions, just feel free to ask it. If not, uh, it was such a pleasure to have you, Melissa. So I listened to so much of your presentations and I enjoyed each and every time the same. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I enjoy doing it. So thank you so much for having me. Just uh, for the people uh, being here, so next week we are here again uh, with uh, Foamy and uh, join us uh, while you can see all the what is upcoming on our meetup and this session will also be posted in a few days whenever I pick up some time to do editing on our YouTube channel. So looking at uh, lots of uh, thanks uh, to Melissa. So it was really a pleasure. Yeah, and thank you very much. Appreciate it. If anybody is interested, Melissa is tomorrow also on SQL Bits. So if you are there or uh, want to listen virtually, feel free. Are you in person in SQL Bits, Melissa, or virtual? No, it's it's a uh, twenty minute remote session. Uh, I call it uh, the whirlwind okay. tour of the Power BI adoption roadmap. So. Um, you actually heard today most of what I'll what I'll talk about, but I'll talk a little bit more about the ten steps, the maturity levels, um, that kind of stuff, and and I do a little bit more on the Power BI implementation planning piece that's new. So, about fifteen minutes of me talking and about five minutes Q and A. Okay, perfect. Thank you, thank you everybody for joining, and see you next week then. All right. Take care, everybody.